Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about Trump's foreign policy roadmap. How will it differ from his last term in office? Our guest for the show is Rupmati Kandekar, geopolitical analyst. Welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay. Thank you for having me on your show. It's always my pleasure, Jay. There's so much to discuss today. Let's discuss first uh, the news about who in his cabinet, who in Trump's cabinet is going to be involved in determining foreign policy. Can you talk about the people he's appointed or suggest that he will appoint? Yeah, Jay. So Trump has trumpeted that he doesn't want the bad, disloyal people that were in his first Trump uh, term. So he wants to do... uh, some uh, come up, come up with some changes. So the only announcement that he made was of Susan uh, Susie Wiles, who was the chief of staff. Then we have uh, two hawks, Jay, uh, two Florida hawks, like we call them, uh, uh, Mike Waltz and uh, Mar- Mario Rubio, who are going to be Mike Waltz is going to be the national security advisor, and uh, Mario uh, Mar- Mar- Mario Rubio is, Rubio is going to be the next secretary of state. So both of these are known as hardliners from uh, um, Florida, and they have a very, um, what do you say, rigid view of what they want uh, in their uh, policy making. And we also have the appointment of, he calls it the border czar. So Tom uh, Human, who has got an extensive deportation program, which was uh, promised by Trump in his entire political campaign. So there's going to be, Uh, a mass deportation happening, uh, aided by even military. And, uh, you know, there was a question asked by the reporters that what would be the humane side of this deportation? He he, he casually said that we would deport families along (laughs) outside. So they have no mercy this time. Uh, Then you have the UN ambassador who is uh, Ellie Stefanik. She's a hardliner supporter of Israel. Then you have the deputy chief of staff for policy, who is who was uh, who had bought the Muslim ban on travel. You remember that one, which had come in his first term, and it came up with a lot of criticism. So he is back. And you have the Environmental Protection Agency. You have Lee Zeldin. Uh, he is going to do uh, environmental deregulation so that the American businesses can um, uh, benefit. And uh, you know you have a robust uh, progress without any environmental. Uh, consideration. So, uh, Jay, this kind of uh, appointments give you an idea of what his foreign policy is going to be in a second term. These people, like for example, uh, Mar- Marco Rubio, Rubio was his, uh, uh, what do you say, his rival in his primary. He called him a con artist and the most vulgar politician of all time. But today he is his Secretary of State. So, uh, you see, these are uh, these. Um, uh, Mario Rubio and Mark, Mark, Mike Waltz are known as hawks because they have a very uh, anti-China and anti-Iran stance. And he brings them into the fold. So he's letting go of his political bickerings. He's, letting, uh, he's bringing forth people who uh, are going to carry forward what he has spoken. So Jay, let's go and just analyze how this works out, Jay. Uh, why, well, I wanted to ask you a, a little about uh, the two principles, as I see it. That is Mike Walsh, who's been a, a critic of Joe Biden's foreign policy, uh, and Marco Rubio, you mentioned, uh, who has taken hardline positions on China, Iran, and Venezuela. So uh, it strikes me that uh, n- neither of them is experienced, has is occupied a position involving foreign policy. Um, and they can you know, be critics of uh, Joe Biden's policy, and they can take hardline positions, but that's rhetoric. Uh, I, my observation is that neither of them is experienced either in determining policy or in if implementing policy. I cannot visualize either of them occupying mm, foreign relations positions. What about you? Can you imagine them? Occupying these positions, you need previous experience. You need previous. You need a lot of uh, what do you say? Uh, Decision making experience when you want to come into these these kind of positions. And these people, like you said, have none of that. And they have been critics, and they have just indulged in rhetoric. Now, Jay, they promised to bring this policy of America first. 
Secondly, they want to, they have their eyes on China and uh, Iran. They want to, uh, what do you say? They want to um, bring in foreign policy and aggressive foreign policy. So we are, we always strive to have a dynamic foreign policy, but an aggressive foreign policy is going to be the be questionable because they, they have indulged in this campaign in a very aggressive manner, like we have seen it. The entire Trump campaign was extremely aggressive in their, um, uh, in each and every scenario. Now, if you have mm -hmm. that in foreign policy, it doesn't work, Jay. There has to be a lot of patience. There has to be a lot of negotiations. There has to be a lot of give and take, like we said. And uh, today's world is so delicate that we cannot have this kind of bullish uh, attitude outside. It has to be a very accommodating attitude. Then we can go ahead because we see <clears throat> Russia was at the receiving end of economic sanctions. But the maneuvering that it has done has saved it from total collapse because fighting a war at one end and going into economic collapse would have hurt Russia a lot. But that kind of being able to go to uh, small, small countries and negotiating, you know, this kind of diplomatic efforts do work. Now, you can't just say China is my enemy and I want to be aggressive and then pick up people who are aggressive on China and put them at the helm of things. Because like you said, we don't know how much time Trump can uh, devote to this. So these people will be having the majority of decision making process. So how much experience they have is going to determine a lot of foreign policy uh, roadmaps ahead. Jay. Yeah, I want to I want to get into that, actually. You know, first of all, it's really interesting that uh, he would consider Marco Rubio, who has criticized him in the past. I thought that the second Trump administration um, would be completely loyal and that everybody that he um, you know, appoints would be a complete loyalist to him. With Marco Rubio, uh, it's, it's kind of chameleon-like. Uh, he shifted from hating Trump to loving Trump. And that we've seen that before, and, and it can shift both ways. So if he's thinking that Marco Rubio is going to be a loyalist, it's not at all clear to me, or um, that it is clear that he picked the right guy, uh, at least according to his own notion of surrounding himself with uh, loyalists. On the other hand, something you said a minute ago, you know, Trump is a micromanager. We know that from so many things that he's done. Um, Trump is going to micromanage everything. Uh, Trump doesn't want any obstacles, no obstructions. He wants to do it all himself. He wants to fix it all himself, his, his word. And so <clears throat> these guys uh, may or may not actually determine policy. They may have to listen to him, take instructions from him. Uh, and the question I, I put to you is just exactly how active could he be, would he be, can he be? Um, and how involved would he be, given the isolationist mood of the country and the isolationist mood that he expresses during his expressed during his campaign? Um, how much involvement will he have? Do you think, Rup Mati? Hey, Trump is known to demand total personal loyalty from his aides and his cabinet members. That is no secret to none, and uh, that's what he does with these cabinet picks. And uh, Marco Rubio was supposed to be his vice president mate. But uh, that did not happen, and now he's got the next best thing, that is the Secretary of State. So, um, Jay, he is giving, he's holding these people close to him, and there is going to be, a, say, a mini rivalry between uh, um, Marco Rubio and uh, Mans because they are going to compete for the next uh, post, isn't it, Jay? They want to come back as the next successor or whatever, but there is going to be a kind of... Uh, uh, twist and tussle 100% without any doubt. Now, Trump has to not only micromanage these small rivalries, he has to uh, make sure that what he has spoken is implemented. And that is okay in a business, but to do that with foreign policy is very, very difficult because the determinants are external. It's not going to be his environment. It's going to be an, a foreign environment. And you don't know how uh, the other countries are going to react and how the other countries are going to accept that U.S. pressure or because 
today's need uh, is Jay to work towards uh, making the dollar popular again, towards business, towards economics. It's very, very clear that we don't want to go for a de-dollarization in a global, uh, on a global scale. Maybe we can limit it to BRICS and then make it fade out. But de-dollarization on a global scale will hurt the US economy uh, too much in the long term. So first efforts for the economy. You mentioned uh, Vance, and uh, Vance has really not been much in the paper. Um, with Kamala Harris, although uh, Biden sort of put her to the side, she did have some involvement in foreign policy. He gave her projects and places to yeah. go, uh, things to do um, along the lines of relating to other countries in foreign policy. And I'm really wondering, from what you've said and what I've read, whether Vance will be, uh, you know, shuttled off to the side here. He hasn't really been mentioned very much, and you're right. He's in a kind of, uh, you know, competition with these other guys. He may or may not have a role in foreign policy. I'm uh, not clear how uh, Trump is going to, you know, use him or let him enter into the decision process. Um, any thoughts about that? Will will Van is Vance a threat? You know, to Trump, maybe he is, and maybe Trump will sideline him. What do you think? Jay Vance is very, uh, he's a personality of his own. He has come from a drug addicted family and he's come overcome obstacles to rise to this second most important position in American politics. So he's a struggler in his own right and he's a self achiever in his own right. So, for, uh, you know, he, uh, like we've seen Trump come up with his own achievements. When you have self made people, there is always that urge to do better. It's never that I've done this and I can relax. So uh, expect the dynamics to always change. And uh, he asking for more positions or he taking a more proactive role. Now, Biden was giving Kamala Harris a, a more proactive role in foreign policy because he was unable to take up the task. And uh, uh, they were working as a team. But uh, Trump is very, very... Uh, narcissist, can I use the word? He does not want, he will not want Vance to be his teammate. It has to be his subordinate. He works in that kind of a monarchy system, Jay. He's the king and then there is the court. He, they can't be his, um, what do you say, co-rulers. So uh, Biden had no problem with Kamala Harris walking alongside him uh, or uh, carrying out tasks on his behalf. So there's going to be a big difference in this cabin in this administration versus the previous administration. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask you about that uh, you know you mentioned Putin, mm -hmm. and I was really struck by what happened recently, where Russian state TV, um, you know, broadcast nude photos of uh, Trump's wife, which I thought was really interesting because it was obviously from Putin, and it was an insult and humiliated Trump's family and Trump. And so we have a kind of a uh, a preview of what Putin might do. Remember that Putin is the one trying to undo the dollar. Putin is the one who's trying to, you know, organize um, <clears throat> the BRICS uh, group and others uh, to, um, you know, undermine the United States in general. That is his big mission. He's the leader of that. And so we we have the possibility that Putin will turn against Trump that he will undermine Trump and whatever Trump does vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy, uh, you know, in Europe, in NATO, in Ukraine, in Russia, that uh, Putin will will undoubtedly, ultimately pull the rug out from under him. Uh, what does it tell you about that TV broadcast? What does it tell you about Putin's obvious attempt to um, dismiss and marginalize uh, Trump and his family? Jay, um he will not uh, admit to that. We've seen that it's it's a poke, poking uh, attempt. But uh, J Trump will he has seen enough of this in his lifetime to react to this, and he will ignore it because he is known to ignore so much criticism of him. Or you know, uh, Trump is not that kind of a person who will give an answer directly and forthright. He will keep it in his mind and probably give him an answer at a later date. But uh, we have seen that Putin um, is just will just keep it to up to this. He will not come beyond this because Trump is serving his interests more than any other president would have uh, done. He's his best buddy. 
or best option that we can say that has come into the White House. Russia's demand was that Ukraine should not enter NATO. Trump is coming up with the promise that he doesn't want the NATO. So, Jay, it's working in uh, their, their favor. And uh, there are two, uh, two politicians who are working very selfish, selfishly and in the process, ignoring what is collected. Well, let's look at the challenges around the world. You know, the Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned that this is way over their heads. In fact, way over Trump's heads. Um, but here we have uh, issues, we have contentions, we have you know difficult challenges. And I'll list uh, just the places that I thought about for this show. There's Europe, there's Western Europe, um, there's NATO, and um, you know the European Union. But, um, for that matter, there's um, you know there's there's the UK. Um, there's Ukraine and uh, and Russia and uh, all the countries around Russia that Russia would like to take over, uh, both in the Baltics and the Balkans uh, and in uh, Central Asia. And then you have the Middle East, which is very difficult. Um, Israel and Gaza and Iran and all the proxy terrorist groups. You have Africa, which is you know got a whole lot of terrorists all over it. And uh, every time you turn around, there's a civil war. And people are killing each other, and uh, you know Africa is in in many ways um, a, a continent headed for disaster. And then you have uh, Putin and his friends, his uh, his leadership friends. You have Modi, you have Xi Jinping, you have Kim Jong Un, um, and others, uh, as expressed through BRICS. And we need to talk about how the U.S. would handle Quad, the Quad, and how the U.S. would handle China. So that's my little list of uh, you know the global issues, the global challenges that that are at top of mind right now. So my question to you is, how in the world are these guys going to address all the thorny problems in all those places? Your thoughts? So uh, Jay, uh, these four four five leaders who are uh, together at Trump's first term are coming back together uh, in his, in Trump's second term after a break. And uh, you see, Jay, from his appointments, like we discussed now, his first uh, target is going to be China and uh, Iran, because they, he has hardliners who have thoughts against, uh, want to take humane action against China for the Uyghur Muslims uh, problem. They want to stop uh, Iran's nuclear program. You have support for Israel. You have uh, them striving or them, uh, Trump, coming up and saying that he wants to stop the Ukraine-Russia war and he wants to stop the Middle East conflict and wants to end uh, the U.S. entanglement in these two conflicts because he doesn't want them to escalate. Because when the drone attack happened of Ukraine in Russia, immediately Trump has called up Putin and told him <clears throat> not to escalate the problem. He's kind of going to, uh, he calls this as a war which has reached a stalemate and has to come to a conclusion. So his point is a one sentence that he wants to get a conclusion to the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Now, how he is doing it, or what he's going to do for it, or hand over Ukraine to Putin, like we are seeing it happen, uh, that is going to be the only option, like we see, uh, because he's not going to provide uh, Zelensky with the arms and ammunition and finance that is needed. So that means... Ukraine cannot stand up to the army of Russia and going to fall down. That's evident in that. Europe, Jay, um, he is known, um, Trump is known to cut costs. And, excuse me, for that, he wants to stop NATO funding. And uh, when he talks about climate deregulation, Jay, he wants to uh, get rid of the climate protocol and allow U.S. businesses to... Uh, function in such a way that they work towards only American interests, letting go of all the environmental regulations that we have in place right now. So climate regulation goes for a complete toss in his term, and he doesn't want to fund, because one of the biggest funders of climate change uh, um, reduction efforts is the US. One of the biggest uh, funders to uh, foreign policy um, forums like the uh, United Nations, like uh, NATO, 
all these people is the US. And when he stops the budgeting, Jay, this infrastructure in international organizations suffers a huge loss because they have salaries, they have basic maintenance, and when they can't do it, then you have these international organizations which function without a secretariat, like the BRICS, like the Quad. They are just foreign policy people meeting from place to place. They come into prominence. And that is where foreign policy dynamics will change so much. We, we haven't talked about the, the uh, tariffs, because the tariffs are an expression of uh, foreign policy, aren't they? And uh, he's likely to go way higher than, than now. The economists tell him it's not a good idea, um, but he persists and uh, he drills down. He's going to increase tariffs, not only on China, but on a number of other countries. Uh, to cover all kinds of imports. Now, of course, um, I, th I think we can conclude that's wrong. Uh, the economists tell us it's wrong. It's going to create inflation because ultimately the American consumer uh, will will pay those tariffs, not, not the country exporting to the U.S. The American consumer will pay, not the country exporting to the U.S. And, and what I find interesting is that that is going to have a secondary effect on the countries who are, you know, the the target of these tariffs. Uh, can you can you speak about that in terms of foreign policy? It doesn't make life friendlier. It, it is not a tool by which you can make you know better relations. It, on the contrary, it is it is a, a tool which will distance you from the countries you impose those tariffs on theoretically. Uh, what are the foreign policy implications of the tariff program, the, the tariff initiative that he's going to undertake? Yeah, JC, in a flourishing world, in a globalization world, globalizing world, we had the free trade agreement between the uh, Americas and uh, the South Americas. There was free movement of trade without, with low tariffs, with no tariffs. This is the way you have economic prosperity, which is shared. Things which you don't have, you can get from another place easily with ease ease of payment ease of um, uh, movement that is the crux of having low tariffs now when trump is proposing that he wants to increase the export tax uh, and uh, decrease the uh, uh, sorry uh, increase the uh, import tax and decrease the export tax he wants to increase uh, america's exports and increase uh, decrease the imports so he wants american economy to uh, have a self-producing effect and uh, he's, he wants to concentrate on the automobile industry, which is a labor intensive uh, industry. And Jay, we know one thing, that when countries wanted to get into uh, rapid industrialization, something like Germany, they concentrated on the automobile industry. So Trump is proposing this kind of a plan to uh, have the American automobile industry uh, give them a boost and uh, have them export outside. Uh, countries which are not good with America, like he uses good and bad in a very casual way, he wants to increase their tariffs so that they can't, uh, we can have easy Im uh, imports from them. Uh, he He's targeted Canada, where in, wherein we should have free trade with Canada. He's targeting Canada because he doesn't like Trudeau. He just does not like Trudeau. So uh, we have very uh, kindergarten uh, uh, colorings to his foreign policy doctrine, Jay, and uh, leaders which he likes, he will come closer to them. Leaders which he does not like, he will distance America from them. And that is where we are going to have a big issue, Jay. Uh, right now, the voters feel it's okay to have elected Trump, but there are going to be implications for this in the long term. And uh, that's where we'll have Maybe he will take it on a bubble of uh, progression and it may just collapse if it does not work right. So uh, foreign policy and economic policy is a combination that works. So you can't create a bubble and burst. You know, you raised some interesting points there. Uh, number one is, uh, I don't know if people really understand that uh, the world is kaleidoscopically changing. And relationships between these countries, these, these blocks of countries are changing. And if you offend one of them, you run the risk of offending all of them, including people you really don't want to offend and it is not in your interest to offend. 
and and so it's 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 complicated. Uh, you have these very complex layerings of relationships that you have to deal with. So it's not a matter of saying you don't like Justin Trudeau. Uh, it's a matter of figuring out what the consequences are. Uh, and that goes with every single country. You can't run on personalities. And the other point you made, which I'd like your thought about that, the other point you made is, um, and I think this is very important, is that this is, we're talking about the long term here, not the short term. Uh, he may be able to do something, you know, in a few months, um, but it's it, it it's going to have a long term effect for better or worse. And given what he's planning, I think it's going to be worse. And so we may find that what he does changes our essential relations, our foreign relations with countries, not necessarily in the short term or the intermediate term, but in the long term. Uh, he's likely to remake our international relations, our foreign, our foreign relations all over the world in ways that marginalize us, that undermine um, the liberal world order and, and our hegemony. Um, do you agree? Yes, Jay, absolutely agree with this. See, his, his policies to increase exports and decrease imports, uh, China is doing that. China is a manufacturing uh, uh, giant. But Jay, the moment the countries will say we don't want products made in China, it affects them. You remember when we had a ban on TikTok in India? They got affected, their social apps, small, small things which we don't want from... Uh, if uh, Modi came up with the thing that buy make in India, it hurt China. So any America says buy products made in America, it will hurt China. So we can't go down that path. We have seen how it is. There has to be... a very balanced uh, progress of the economy. You have to have self-sustaining units uh, serving the domestic uh, demand rather than trying to supply outside. Because when you try to uh, play with foreign um, economics, Jay, I, like we said, that it depends on foreign factors. You have to try to go within the country, make your agricultural uh, um, uh, sector more subsistence uh, self-sufficient and uh, the su subsistence level for your domestic population should be perfect and uh, we should not depend on foreign countries for say corn from uh, another country it should be you should promote the agrarian sector as much as you promote the industrial sector then there'll be a balanced inward growth only then he can look outward so that is where he is lacking Jay. there is pure um, bloated uh, promises made, but the repercussions are going to be such, it can't be so uh, fragile, Jay. The way he speaks, it's fragile. You know, all of this, uh, and especially looking back on his first term, um, is pretty destructive for the United States. Uh, we, we didn't do a good job in foreign policy during his first term. We alienated our allies. You know, this is the most important thing is to stay close with your allies and have relationships with them that are robust and, and nutritious and meaningful going forward. They're the ones you've got to count on. I mean, it's clear enough in the world today that your allies are really important to you in every which way, including, of course, national security. And to undermine those relationships is, is not only, you know, uh, uh, counterindicated, but it is very dangerous. So if he continues doing what he was doing during the you know his first term, that is alienating allies, making friends with people who are obviously sworn to undermine us, like Putin, um, where does that take us? Uh, where does the where does the United States go? Where do where do our allies go? Where do our enemies go? Where does the world go? I know that's a hard question, but give me a look into the future, would you? Tell me about the ghost of Christmas future, assuming that Trump micromanages this and makes all the mistakes he made before. Uh, yeah, Jay, it's it's a big, uh, scary uh, thing that's going to come up. But he's trying to project himself as uh, he's back with his friends kind of uh, thing in the international circle. And uh, when he's picked up the phone, he's picked up the top three people he felt good with. You know, you have leaders who are uh, putting it up on X and Twitter that um, they've called up uh, Trump and said, welcome back and all these things. So uh, he's, uh, he's portraying himself to be back in the helm of things. And uh, Jay, 
he is presenting a rosy picture of what it is, but the dynamics have changed since his last term. And he fails to forget, uh, consider that in any which way. He is thinking, he has finished his first term and this is the beginning of his second term. He has just ignored uh, the Biden uh, tenure. And uh, during the Biden tenure, we have seen how many changes have taken place. So for him to make a mark, because he's going to spend most of his time undoing Biden's decisions, Jay. And that's where he's going to waste his time and he's going to waste America's time. Because like you know, time is very precious on the international stage for sure. Uh, so many things happen and so many things are stagnating and we need resolutions quick and swift. So his promises of mass deportation, uh, how many human rights cries will be there? What, you know, you, I, I literally fail to understand what the American voter thought and considered uh, in his policies before they voted. It's a big, big question mark which will go down in history as uh, how to pre present this picture of the future. We don't know what happened exactly. I think so many people must be reeling into this. What happened and why did it happen? You know, uh, one one thing very interesting that um, I'd like to bring up, and, and that is the news story about how Iran uh, is having a meeting this week among its uh, leaders, its um, more <laughs> moderate, uh, you know, president now, um, uh, with uh, about the possibility of cutting a deal with Trump. Now, what that suggests is that somehow they they see uh, the you know, that possibility. They see a, a, a possibly a new deal from him. The other the other element is that they are afraid of him because he's unpredictable and and he has a you know big military to order around. And maybe they're worried that uh, you know he would do destructive things to them. And that's why they're having this big meeting and maybe the possibility of renegotiating with it. But you can't forget, of course, that they hate the US. They've hated the U.S. since 1979 and before. They hated the U.S. with the Shah of Iran way back when. Um, I don't know why they would change that now, except that they are afraid of him. So he's a saber rattler, and he's unpredictable but powerful. And sometimes people and countries react to that power by saying, we'd better pay attention to him. So my question to you, it's a hard one. All my questions are hard ones. Um, is, you know, how much traction can he get by being, you know, a global intimidator? Is he capable of doing that? And uh, how will nations and groups of nations react to Trump's intimidation on the global stage? Jay, America is very capable of intimidating on the global stage. And Trump, uh, we have seen that uh, he's He's an aggressive person when it comes to foreign policy. And he's made his decisions very clear that he's anti-Iran and anti-China by his very first appointments. And uh, Jay, when we see that Iran is at such a precarious position right now, they want to go ahead with their nuclear program. They're on the verge of getting a nuclear bomb. They want to uh, fulfill this uh, devilish desire of wiping Israel off the map, and Trump is not going to let that happen because he was the only president who got Jerusalem its consulate, so uh, embassy. So we have to keep that in mind that he is a, a supporter of Israel and uh, immediately Qatar ordered Hamas leaders out of Qatar. So uh, you had movements as soon as he took over office. So uh, maybe they were underestimating Biden for neglecting this part of uh, uh, the Middle East conflict and when you see Trump with all his strength and all his vigor coming in and he is going to focus on this Middle East conflict like he owns it, uh, you remember the uh, Iranian ships that had come in the Persian Gulf? Immediately he had sent the aircraft carrier. So he's swift in that kind of a, uh, um, a checkmate uh, maneuver that he's got. Jay. And that's what hurts these Iranians because they want to do something in the region. And with Trump, they can't. And that's where they are stuck, Jay. So cutting a deal with him, like they, 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 did, they did cut a deal with Biden and they did get a little relief and a, a breathing space. What happens with Trump, Jay? He uh, uh, visually 
it seems that he seems to trust Putin. And he seems to trust that he's got the Ukraine-Russian conflict under control. So his entire concentration is towards the Middle East. Uh, and that is what worries Iran the most. Because Iran was planning now to use Iraqi bases for attacking uh, uh, Israel. They were trying to have a more comprehensive and suddenly they did not, maybe they did not expect Trump to take office. And they expected a more soft line or maybe an ignorant stance towards the regional um, aspirations of Iran. And with Trump, he doesn't want anybody to come ahead expect, except for his own voice. So uh, we want to have <laughs> just that ahead, Jay. The problem is that uh, you want to play that game, uh, you run the risk of, um, of having violence. Um, you know, you can provoke a country or a group of countries uh, into a, a violent uh, exchange. And that violent exchange, as we saw in so many ways um, over the past century, uh, can result in a world war. Um, and in a world war these days, with the weapons that we have, it could be very destructive for the human race, for everyone. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a little concerned, I'm very concerned uh, that Trump's um, moves uh, which are not necessarily based on this, you know, the the norms of diplomatic relations uh, that we have known and relied on. Uh, his moves uh, could result in in a violent exchange with, you know, some nations that that flare out into mo more nations, and then a, a global war, um, which nobody nobody wins that war now. And so, your thoughts about the risk involved? Jay, he, luckily, luckily, he boasts about that there's been no war in his tenure and no country has invaded any other country in his tenure. So he's hoping to continue that record in his this, uh, uh, this second term. So we are hoping that he keeps it at peace and he tries to negotiate rather than uh, be aggressive. And uh, Jay, uh, these two conflicts will never ever be solved unless there is U.S. dynamic intervention, Jay. There has to be a very hardcore uh, American stance in these two conflicts for it to end both these conflicts, the Ukraine-Russia and the Hamas-Israel. Uh, uh, because we were not having that decisiveness in that uh, American foreign aggress uh, aggressive foreign policy, maybe there was this... Uh, stalemate that was happening or continuation that was happening. So it's just keeping fingers crossed that this comes as a positive um, aspect of Trump's uh, presidency, that these two conflicts will come to an end rather than keep on continuing. Because having terrorists in your backyard is not a good thing to have with Israel. And Israel, nothing has stopped yet. The terrorist attacks still continue. Yeah, and terrorism has taken a a kind of a, a new turn because we've seen news stories about how Iran, um, you know, is able to and has tried to assassinate people in the U.S. We've we've seen um, news stories about how Putin, um, likewise, uh, is uh, has tried to set up an infrastructure to, uh, you know, do violence and assassinate people in the U.S. So the national boundaries we thought protected us before are no longer all that much reliable. And, um, you know, 9-11 could happen again, or assassinations yes. in this country could happen again. And, and I think we are, you know, we have to fold in the possibility that, that bad foreign relations and bad diplomacy uh, could result in really awful, awful attacks on the U.S. in the U.S., your thoughts? Yes, Jay, yes. Because, see, when the Moscow terror attack happened, you had Putin line up uh, every person which was had a, a name, Islamic name, out of the country. Authoritarian country can do that. China can do that. But as a democracy, when we are promising mass deportations, we are going to have so much of tension in society, Jay. There are people who are already there inside, who have got ID cards or who have legalized their stay. But they will have their own near and dear ones deporting. So there will be a tremendous amount of tension within. It's not so easy to have mass deportations in a democracy. 
That's where it will fall short. These deportations will have an effect. They are going to be deported to their country of origin. Now, can you uh, deport Palestinians to Gaza Strip? So that becomes an issue. So they are going to find ways to come through the jungles and stay in the US. They're going to have their frustrations come out. The terrorist attack that was carried out on Israeli soil will come here because like we said in previous programs, they have no love for life. They can do suicide missions and that is where the danger falls because democracy, humanity, all work towards caring for life or preserving life or holding on to life. Terrorism works to giving up lives to take lives. So it's two opposite ends of the spectrum and uh, they care nothing about life. And that's the problem, Jay. Now, we haven't mentioned um, the uh, United Nations. And in earlier discussions, um, you know, we have kind of come to the conclusion that they are, um, you know, unable to do anything anymore. Um, but he did appoint uh, Elise Stefanik there. And uh, she's, I guess she's a, a loyalist. Uh, I guess she's, she's a Harvard Law graduate. Uh, she's not a lightweight, um, although I think she's on the wrong side of the of the coin. But there, there she is, um, and that's uh, one of his earliest appointments. What does that signal about Trump's support of the United Nations, his use of the United Nations to express his policies and propaganda? Um, what does it mean for the United Nations? Uh, it, will will there be mm, some kind of denouement for the United Nations here? Eli Stefanik is a very hardliner for Israel. She's a big supporter of Israel. And uh, bringing her into uh, this appointment signals that he wants the UN to take a pro-Israel stance. And uh, Jay, in his first tenure, he, he spoke very, and he did it. He cut the budgeting to the UN. And in this tenure also, he is going to put forth his policies. If you don't do it, he's going to cut the budget. So uh, that's kind. That's the way Trump functions. If you do this, I will give you this. If you don't do this, I will cut back on this. It's a very business acumen that he brings into his uh, politics also, Jay. So if he doesn't get what he wants, he will uh, cost cut on what he is giving. That is a, a big, um, what do you say? It's a big feature of Trump's policies, not only domestically, but internationally. And this uh, uh, giving um, and taking Business is very, very important, Jay. Like I had told you in the previous program, for NATO, the security blanket that you provide Europe, there is no take back. We want free markets of Europe. We want free entry into European markets. That's the take that should be for the give that we give NATO security to European nations. That kind of negotiation is well needed and it should come into play in American politics right now, Jay. And um, in the UN, um, Stefanik is going to, she's coming forth as a person who will um, push for uh, Israel reforms or, you know, when we have the UN reluctant to even put the word Hamas into resolutions, we need something like this. And um, we know Israel even banned Guterres from uh, the Secretary of Secretary General of the UN to come to Israel. So that kind of frustration is going on with the UN system. To conclude, then, Rupmati, we've been talking about uh, Trump's foreign policy roadmap, what we know, what we can expect, how will it differ from his last term in office. And I, I know this is a very broad question, but I wonder, do you think he will be successful or do you think he will mm, muck things up? What is your expectation in general? Jay, we come at such a crucial time this in, uh, in uh, American politics because Right now, we are on the brink of such a, a volatile international system where de-dollarization is going on, conflicts going on. We need this presidency to be successful. But we have uh, Trump at the helm. So we are expecting for him to stir America into the right direction. We don't want him to take America uh, into a, a place where we cannot come out from. So though his rhetoric sounds very... Um, uh, what is bloated, we have to just pray that his policy of put America first stays very hard in his mind and he keeps on putting America first, whether domestically or internationally. That is where we have to just pray for that 
and he keeps his mind very rational. Jay. Well, we'll follow it for sure with you. Um, yes. We've been talking about Trump's foreign policy roadmap, how it will differ from his last term in office uh, with our geopolitical analyst, Rupati Kandakar. Thanks to everybody for watching, and thank you, Rupati, for helping us understand all of these issues. Aloha. Aloha, Jay. Thank you so very much. Thank you.